we're really talking about in this whole session, and that's about raising money. And you can ask me any questions you want, by the way, after I finish. We'll have time for questions. So if you want to ask questions that are not to the finance, you can, but I'm going to focus on, on raising finance. Now, I found that you actually have to raise finance from lots of different uh, sources. I mean, you've got the traditional raising money from overdrafts. I remember the first overdraft we ever got was from Lloyd's Bank, our first bank. And it was a handwritten cash flow. And the manager gave me a £7,000 overdraft. And he said, I'm only giving this to you because you're a qualified chartered accountant. Do you think they'd otherwise accept a written cash flow like this? Um, anyway, Lloyd's Bank are our bankers now, many years later. But then you have to raise money through other forms because, yeah, £7,000 overdraft, so it was increased to £11,000. Not going to get you very far when you're trying to build a consumer brand from scratch. So you get things like this. And this is where government can be a huge supporter to business. I mean, the best thing government can do with business is to get out of the way and let business get on with it. But actually, government can be a big supporter and a capitalist and a helper. And this was brought in by the government just before I started COBRA, which still exists today, where the government will guarantee your loan because the banks want security. And like me, I have no security. I mean, my uh, mode of transport, our first company car, I couldn't even offer that as security because it was a battered. Citroën de Chevaux called Albert. Um, and I borrowed it, I uh, borrowed the money from my partner, it cost 295 pounds. It was very bright green and battered. And you could, and I'm not exaggerating any of this, you could actually see the road through the holes of the floor of the car, and it needed push starting every day. And we'd carry 15 cases of Cobra in that car. And we would park it a little ahead of the Indian restaurant so they wouldn't see the delivery vehicle of the most expensive ever at Indian beer. But, you know, I couldn't exactly offer Albert security. So if you've got no security offer, what, what happens with these loans is, first you have to convince the bank to lend you the money, and the government actually guarantees 85% of the loan. So if you default, the bank gets 85% of the money from the government. They're not easy to get, because banks don't even like losing 15%, but that's another story. Um, because I was a chartered accountant, I suppose, I had a bit of a head start. Um, it helps to be able to read balance sheets while you're asleep. And uh, I remember this old Victorian instrument called a bill of exchange. And when you study accounting, you learn about these. And I found an opportunity to use them. Because six months down the road, when we started Cobra, initially, none of the big distributors were interested in us. They all said, even a fair. Kingfisher the biggest Indian beer brand in India, had already been in the UK for eight years before we started. They'd already been brewing in the UK for five years before we started. They had draft installations in thousands of restaurants. They were very well entrenched. And there were about eight or nine other Indian beers trying to make an entry into the Indian beer market in the UK, let alone all the other competitive beers from all over the world, like Sol, the Mexican beer, Corona. They're all coming in from all over the world. So the distributor said, you will fail like all the others except in our industry, Kingfisher. Six months down the road, when we managed to get the beer into some of the top Indian restaurants, we were getting regular reorders, the distributor started showing interest. And one distributor in particular, the largest, the biggest Indian restaurant distributor in the country that supplies over 1,000 Indian restaurants, called Gandhi Oracle Food, said, we are now interested in taking you on. So we said, wow, this is our big break, and it was. And they said, we want the exclusivity for the N25 area to supply all the Indian restaurants. Now, I hate giving away exclusivity. We did it at that time. We try not to do it. But I said, okay, in return for giving the exclusivity for the Indian restaurants in the N25, I want something from you. You have great business. You also have a lot of money. And I have no money. And I discovered that they had, at that time, over a million pounds worth of unutilized overdraft facilities because they were a very successful family business built up with no borrowings, they didn't believe in borrowings, they had huge amounts of assets and this overdraft facility they weren't using. I said, you give me 100,000 pounds of that overdraft facility, just set it aside for me and I will arrange everything else with your bank, I even pay the bank fees. And what I was, I went to Barclays Bank and I arranged a bill of exchange facility. So what would happen is a container beer would arrive from India, we'd offload the, the case, the container would go on the back of a truck, come off the ship, 
drive along to go and be over foods in East London. There would be following in our there. And we'd get to the distributor's warehouse, we'd watch this whole container being unloaded, all the cases being unloaded, and then I'd run upstairs to Mr. Valandy and have a bill of exchange and ask him to sign and accept. And he would then accept this bill of exchange. I would give him the number of days credit that he wanted. Let's say for argument's sake he wanted 90 days credit, I gave him 90 days credit. I would run across then now there, we'd drive across to the city, to their bankers, to Barclays Bank. And Barclays Bank would then stamp this take it off the over of the city. We then drive back in Alberta for them to our bank, give them the bank of exchange, bill of exchange guaranteed by Barclays Bank. And we had the money at the lowest rate of interest in our bank account on the same day. Now, as a result of that, I got 100,000 pounds of, of money at that stage, which was absolutely invaluable in our group. And the Gandhis to this day, by the way, are one of our biggest customers and take tens of containers of beer every month and we've built up a fantastic relationship with them. So that's an example of something you probably won't hear about. Now the equity temptation. Of course when you start initially nobody thinks you stand a chance. And it's if you can imagine the analogy of a horse race. Now you place your bets before the race starts. Once the race has started and you see this winner zooming along ahead, of course everyone wants to bet on that winner. And that's what happens in business. When you start the race, no one believes in you. When you're out there in front, they all want to invest in you. And that's the time to hold on to your shares. That's the time to say, sorry, I'm going to win this race. And when I win this race, there's a huge pot of gold at the end. And it's going to be hugely valuable. If I give something away to you now, it's going to be much less valuable and you've got to hold on to those shares. I remember there was one very, very wealthy Asian investor, and this was three years into Cobra, and the brand had really proved its potential, and he wanted to invest 200,000 pounds, but wanted 50% of Cobra in return. And I can tell you, 200,000 pounds when you're really early in your business at that time, so tempting to give away that 50%, but I resisted. Similarly, you have business angels. I mean, business angels are hugely, hugely valuable in starting up a business. I'll give you one example of a business angel who helped us out. We were trying to get a government small firm's loan guarantee scheme loan, and we had already had 50,000 pounds, which we'd been granted. We were entitled to 250,000 pounds under the government small firm's loan guarantee scheme loan. So we went to a bank to look for the 200,000 pounds that we were entitled to. Every bank we went to said, no, 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 no. Eventually we found one bank that said, yes. And I'll never forget this manager. He was Polish, and he had a moustache that went all the way up here. And he said, I like you. I trust you. I like your brand. I think you're going to be successful. He said, I'm willing to give you this loan. You need about a quarter of a million pounds. I'm meant to be giving you 200,000 pounds. Yep, the government will guarantee 85% of it. But hang on, what's the share capital of Cobra Beer? Now this, remember, we're just three years into, into Cobra Beer. And the share capital was 100 pounds. My partner owned 50 shares, I owned 50 shares. He said, you want to be a serious company and you've got 100 pounds share capital? Come on, what do you think your company is worth? So without even looking at my partner, looking him straight in the eye, I said, a million pounds. He said, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> now prove it. He said, give away some equity. I said, no, I'm not giving away any shares. Come on. Give away 5% and raise 50,000 pounds, which is 5% of a million, and I'll give you your 200,000 pounds. I said, okay, let's do it. And with the help of Brown Thornton, who were our corporate finance advisors and accountants, and on to this day, we found a business angel who put in the £50,000 for 5%. What an investment. I mean, it's, he's done phenomenally well and good for him. He's become a great friend. And true to his word, this bank manager gave me the loan. And the loan came through the day before my wedding day. My wedding day is the happiest day of my life, just made me happier. 
at the same time, there was a venture capitalist ready to give us the 250,000 pounds and wanted 33% of the company. 5%, 33%. Wasn't easy, but I saved that equity. So business angels can be hugely um, helpful. And then, of course, you have various forms of finance. Debtor finance. One of the best ways I've found to raise money for a growing business is when you make sales, you have to give credit, your debtors owe you money, you have to wait for that money. It could be an average of 60 days, two months that you wait for that money. You can get finance, but every time you make a sale, a bank or a finance company will give you the money today. And then 60 days later, when your debtor pays you, will collect the money and keep the rest. So, there are two forms of that. One is invoice finance, and the other is factoring. Now, when in the old, when we started using factoring, there was a stigma attached because the old notion was any company that was resorting to factoring its debtors was in trouble. Whereas in the United States, factoring and invoice discounting had already taken off for decades as a form of growth capital finance. And it can be used for lots of different sources of working capital, for product development, for refinancing, for buyouts, for acquisitions. And we started using it. And it's very public when you're factoring that every invoice of yours actually stamps and says, this is being factored. So all your customers know that you're using a factor. That stigma has now disappeared because people know that growing companies use this form of finance. Once you reach a turnover of over a million pounds or so, and, and you've got a good balance sheet, you can progress to invoice discounting where your invoices are not stamped and it's confidential. And every time you make a sale, the invoice financer advances you the money. Up to 85% of your money you get on day one, the 15% when your customer pays you. It's one of the best forms of growth finance that I have come across. And both of them are great. Um, I think the benefits are as your sales grow, your finance grows. Uh, and the difference is, with factoring, it's more expensive. Your customer knows you're doing it. With invoice discounting, it's confidential and it's cheaper. And it's a great, great form of finance. So I've just been giving you some examples of the different forms of finance that we've been raising. But before I give you any more examples, whatever form of finance you're raising, there's certain things that are in common. I think the first is, when you go ask somebody to borrow money or invest in you, they've got to believe in you. It goes back to that trust that I spoke about. And you know what you're doing really is you're selling yourself and you're selling and marketing your company and your brand. And you know when I discovered I could sell? Right here in Cambridge. Because I used to stand with the elections for the union. I don't know, any of you here, union officials? Yeah, you know what it's about. You get a list and you go door to door and you knock on the doors to complete strangers and agree and say, will you vote for me? And when you ask somebody to vote for you, you're selling. And I realized one thing with selling, there's no shortcut and it's very hard work. I used to get on my bicycle, whether it was snowing or whether it was raining, and go from college to college, staircase to staircase, and there was no shortcut to that. And the other thing is, you've got to get people to believe in you and, and trust you. You've got to select your advisors well. I've mentioned Graham Thornton. Has a good firm of accountants like Ernst Young, KPMG, who are behind you, helping you, advising you, putting their name to you, helps. And I think also, you know, this holding on to your shares. It's absolutely essential that you can try and hold on to your shares. And then the persistence. If at first you don't succeed, you keep trying, you keep trying. In 1995, uh, I had a huge change in my business. Before I tell what the analogy is, um, a jet aircraft zooming along the runway, fully laden with fuel, has everything it needs to take off the ground. It doesn't take off, doesn't take off, doesn't take off, doesn't take off. Eventually, that plane lifts off. Starting a business and getting it to take off is a bit like that. That takeoff can take a year. If it's YouTube, it takes a year. If it's Google, it takes three years. In my case, it took five years before the brand actually took off. 
If you've got to have the persistence and the guts and the determination and the drive to stick with it until your plane takes off. My business partner, Arjun Reddy, he decided the plane was not going to take off and he hated the weather again. Yeah. So he decided to go back to India and I bought him out in 1995. 